Hello, and welcome back to CFR, our audacious video cast from the team at whatmatters.com. I'm joined here today, as always, by Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, Ryan. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a really good Q1, and I cannot believe we are in February already. It's like the, the year seems to be going slowly because I'm in England and still in lockdown, uh, but so quickly at the same time. It is. It's a... Uh... But we're here, it's February, and I think folks know that one of our broad objectives as a team, the What Matters team, is to help as many people as we can, teams, organizations, and individuals using OKRs. And over the last month, we've read your questions, and we figured why not dedicate a whole episode to CFRs to answering as many questions as we can. So are we ready, Elizabeth? Well, to quote you, my friend, let's do it. Joining us today is Billy Casey. Billy's on the whatmatters.com team. He's one of our coaches. He's also our OKR shepherd and guides us through our OKR process. Billy is also the creator of Dear Andy. Hey, Billy. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, Billy. It's nice to see you. If you haven't been to our site in a while, Dear Andy is a feature where we answer our readers' questions. So, Billy, Dear Andy, tell me more. Gladly. Uh, so Dear Andy is essentially a bi-monthly advice column on all things OKRs. Uh, it started because we were getting so many great and thoughtful questions in our inbox, and we figured the answers could actually really benefit other OKR users. So we tackle a wide variety of topics, uh, anything from OKR theory to just helping people take their OKRs from good to great. I love it. Billy, where does the name Dear Andy come from? Because obviously you're Billy. <laughs> that is true. I, I I write as Dear Andy, but I am not. My name is not Andy. Um, it's uh, named after the father of OKRs, Andy Grove. So instead of like Dear Abby, we went for Dear Andy. Clever, right? You get it? You get it? <laughs> Billy, I'm so glad you could join us today. I know we get so many questions of all types from our readers, and uh, I want folks to know, our listeners, that if you have questions, you can get help on your OKR journey anytime by getting in touch. Billy, I'm also excited to have you on the show today. And as you're the guy with a lot of answers, I made this for you. <laughs> no? Right, let's tackle some reader and listener questions. Our questions today, like Ryan said, come from our inbox, Twitter, and a few from LinkedIn. Some of them are great, and one of them's a little weird. Off we go. Our first question is for you, Ryan, and it's from Christopher. So Christopher has started his team's OKR journey from what he calls a tactical perspective. They're a small team and they've identified one annual objective and two quarterly objectives. Now he's read that co-ownership of an OKR weakens accountability. And as their team is small, I guess he wants to know, is it okay to have an individual own the OKR as well as one of its key results? Yes, it is. That's a great question. Um, but I, I love that you have a singular guiding objective for you and your team for the whole year. That's really powerful, right? I think one thing we try to coach teams on is for your year long, your long term objectives, try to keep those simple, right? Try to keep them simple because then they can be focused. And, you know, your question was, is it OK to have someone own both the objective as the owner and the key result? And the answer is absolutely. I think one of the things you start to feel on Teams O2 where you might want to put a team name as an owner, and we really like to shy away from that because it's like really about who is on first, right? Who's the person that's going to be taking and tracking the OKR to completion? It doesn't mean that person is solely responsible for delivering on it. It means that they're responsible for the tracking of that objective, being the champion of it, or that KR being the person who's tracking it every step of the way. Billy, what would you say to that? Because I know that I've been in OKR meetings where people have been asked to take ownership of a key result and you can see the fear in their eyes, right? <laughs> there, you can see that they're sitting there going, okay. So well, how do you get around that? 
Well, it's, it's important that uh, taking ownership of a key result should be completely voluntary. You should want to do it. So um, you shouldn't assign people to it. It shouldn't say, Elizabeth, this is yours. It should be a who wants to do this and the people who feel like they want to be responsible for it should should do it. And uh, that way they'll be much, they'll be much more productive because they'll be held accountable for something that they actually care about. So our next question is for you, Andy. Oh, sorry, Billy. It's from Marcus. So Marcus recently took over a development team of about 100 people, and they're implementing their first set of OKRs. And now he told us that due to complaints from management and customers, his new team's projects are taking too long. So they've set a target to reduce the development time of their projects, and now he wants help to turn that into an OKR. So what Marcus would really like to know is if a good objective can be deadline based. So if they aim to get their projects done, say, in 24 months, it has a number in it that makes it a key result, right? Mm -hmm. OK, well, I mean, it sounds like you're asking whether uh, deadlines make good objectives. And mm. I'm going to say, in my opinion, they do not. Uh, deadlines are important, sure, but they don't make for good objectives. Uh, you want your objective to be a statement of purpose, like an inspirational rallying cry, if you will. Like an objective should have soul. Deadlines don't have soul, right? Uh, so None of mine do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> they sure don't. They sure don't. So there's a lot of ways to inspire people, but uh, simply telling someone to work faster, it's just not going to get the best results. So, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, some projects will need to be completed within a certain amount of time, no questions asked. But as far as OKRs go, deadlines, I think, work much better as KRs, as they're measurable and time bound. So I wouldn't recommend using, recommend using a deadline as an objective. But I do think having it as a KR, your instinct is spot on. Well, one way to think about it, too, is that... Uh... If the deadline's the KR, or even if you're tracking deadlines separately, right? I think one thing we like to kind of preach is that OKRs are meant for leading your team, whereas KPIs, JIRA, and a bunch of other things are used to manage, and both are equally important. And so keep your deadlines as a KR or separate, because then you could spend a lot more of your resources, at least pointing your team in the direction you want them to go, right? What does success look like around that deadline time? That's what your, your OKR should try to capture. Excellent. Next. Oh, oh, you guys, it's one of the weirder ones. And it's for me from April. Where is Elizabeth's accent from? Oh. Well, April, funny you should write in from Atlanta because that's my hometown. But I've lived in England for a really long time. So my accent, so we say, is from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean between the two. <laughs> and now that we've solved that mystery, Ryan, the next question is from you. It's from Dakota. And Dakota writes, I know OKRs are supposed to be set quarterly, but do we really need to do this if we know what our annual goals are? What are the benefits of setting quarterly goals versus setting annual goals? Well, that's a great question. Um, the benefit is to be able to like create these moments for you and the team to honestly check in, right? Like what if you you know, set this year long target and you only find out in like Q3, right? Just like a couple of months before that you and the team are completely off track. And so the idea is for these quarterly OKRs to be objectives and key results that help you get to that outcome that you want by the end of the year, right? And so they might be different. They might be measuring different things. They might be pointing your team just kind of like a boat left and right uh, on different parts that you want the team to focus on. I mean, one way to think about it too is if that's the North Star, what can we accomplish in the quarter that makes us feel like we're making good progress? Or even to push the team a little bit to say, well, how could we even get ahead of what we think we can accomplish this year? And I think what you'll find at the end of the quarter is either you knocked it out of the park and when that happens, mm -hmm. you know, to do more of it. It also could mean you might want to change your year end goal. But you may actually find out that, hey, this was a really hard quarter or we didn't accomplish our KR. So we've got to change tactics. We've got to talk to different teams. It's this input so much earlier in the process to help you kind of guide what you need to do next. So great question. And I think we like encourage people to set annual goals too, and do have that uh, guiding star, but that can't be like the only thing that you're focused on. You know, imagine in 2020, like you set your goals and starting in January, 2020, but by the time December rolled, rolled around, we were living in a completely different world. So it's good to have that kind of that flexibility to be able to change and grow as like new challenges arise. Yeah. Well, I think last, 
Oh, so, uh, Elizabeth, I was just thinking like an anti, one of the anti um, practices could be for this one is if you have an annual OKR, you find yourself actually writing out your Q1, 2, 3, 4 OKRs already, right? It's too soon to do that. You know, you shouldn't be plotting out what your OKRs look like for each quarter. Like that's getting ahead of the process in some way. Like the North Star is what you want to get done by the end of the year. This is how we're going to approach it the quarter ahead. And then using that reflection grading cycle to set a great set for Q2 and then again for Q3 and then ultimately Q4. Ryan, I recently had a team ask me a question and this really ties in. And they asked me, what do you do with your thinking for the next quarter? Like if you can't think about it now because we're supposed to think about it later, where do we park that so we don't forget it? Like, what do you, where do those things go? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think for every team, it's a different place. You probably could toss them into a Google Doc. You could, you know, when we get back into our physical worldness of like actually having conference rooms, some people have, you know, parking lots of things. But um, one thing not to hold back on is if some of these ideas are actually critical to address right now. So you've already started the quarter and things are going wrong or a crisis is brewing, like you shouldn't be afraid to wait till the end of the quarter to at least raise it to the team and say, hey, I'm noticing these things. Is this thing articulated as an OKR, right? Is this more important than the ones that we have on our plate right now? Because then as a team, you can say, oh my gosh, it is. We've got to add it to it. We've got to replace mm -hmm. or, hey, let's hold off till the end of the quarter. This is a great priority that we have to tackle. It's perfect for the next the next sprint that we're going to do together. I'm really glad to hear you say if you have to park it in a Google Doc, that's okay. I think they thought there was this big elaborate something you must do and you mustn't think about it before then. So I think they'll be quite relieved to know that really you, you can just put it in a Google mm -hmm. document and see actually where you need to blend it in. So Billy, quick yes. fire question to you. Okay. You up for the next one? Sure am. So... Jim says, my boss says we're going to grade our OKRs at the end of the quarter next month, and it's apparently Jim's first grading. He mm. says, I'm a bit lost, and I don't know what to expect, and I don't want to look dumb. Can you give me more information on grading? I know it has something to do with colors. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Question. yes, that's a great question. Okay, so absolutely. First thing, don't panic. I think people hear grading and all of a sudden they're back in elementary school and they're freaking out. So don't get nervous. Like this process, process like one when, when done correctly, it should be casual and quick and, and friendly, you know? Okay, so there are a couple of different ways to do this, but when I'm guiding our team through grading our OKRs, I like to do a spotlight system. So green means you hit the goal, yellow means you hit some of the goal, but not completely, and red means you did not hit the goal. So it's very, very simple. So the process should be, okay, we go to this KR and you say it was, it's green, it's red, or it's yellow. Uh, so, and since KRs are numerically measurable, you should be able to figure out what color you're at pretty quickly. Um, so we, and when we grade our OKRs, we try not to really dwell on the why or try to explain anything during that process. It should be pretty quick and easy. What color is a KR? Yellow, great, moving on. So don't look at your OKR grading as a performance review. It's more of a check-in, like how do we do on that goal? And the thing to think about when that's happening is the reason why we go quickly is that we try to be really objective about it, right? Did we, true in Andy Grove fashion, did you accomplish it? Did you not? And you got to get through that quick with no conversation yet, because that's the next step, right? When you actually reflect on each of those KRs and say, well, why did we get that green? Let's not take it for granted. What did we do? Who deserves the recognition? What are the bright spots? Or did that green just come get handed to us and actually... We need to even raise our ambition for the next. Billy lives in Brooklyn. I'm sorry, can you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. Yep. Oh, man. Oh, Ryan, <laughs> I, thought you, I, thought you did, I thought you did really well to stick it out for as long as you did. I was like, oh, my God, it's the OKR alarm. Where is it going? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, actually I didn't know we had one of those. <laughs> Right, and you'd play it when you're you get a green OKR. And it actually wasn't, you know, and it actually didn't involve as much effort as you expected, right? And it should like really trigger this feeling that ah, we can be more ambitious. So, Billy, I know you didn't plan that. You do live in Brooklyn, but when the greens happen, it really should force a conversation. Same with the yellows and reds. So, if something's a yellow, why was it a yellow? Do right. we need to change things? Like, how do we, what could we have done to make it a green? And then the reds, especially too, it's like, did we set the wrong goal? Did we not have the right resources? Look at it as a post-mortem of how you fix it, 
not a postmortem of who's at fault. Because when you start to lean on the who's at fault part, the OKR system doesn't prove uh, uh, it's like it doesn't add the value that it should be to your team. One of the ways I like to think about it is that grading OKRs should really be um, used to set the next OKRs. So you grade them so that you can build on the grading and do better, you know, roll them over, iterate, et cetera. Completely. It's all about the next OKR, Elizabeth. It's all mm. about the next one. And by the way, I know that it's sometimes easy for us to say that this grading and scoring part can be very team oriented. And so I think the part here is we have a lot of resources on whatmatters.com as well as in our getting started series, really pushing and encouraging teams to separate the OKR process from really the performance review, blame kind of side of the house. Like the mm. more you separate them and truly use it as a tool to guide your teams, the more you can have these kind of productive conversations. So it's something to keep in mind. And it's all gonna be okay. Take a breath. It's all okay. <laughs> It's all fun. Yeah, but I think we have all been in a lot of meetings where you've walked in there and it has not been, you haven't been transparent through the quarter and nobody knows the surprise you're about to land on them and it doesn't feel very nice. So I am I always talk about my my epiphany moment with OKRs and, and, and grading, uh, certainly. Ryan and Billy, it's time for us to go. I really appreciate you guys answering so many questions for us today. Billy, if people want to ask Dear Andy a question, how do they find you? Uh, sure, yeah. You can email us at hello at whatmatters.com or there's a link to a form in the description below. Perfect. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for listening. And like we always said, we're here standing by answering your questions any way you send them. We'll talk again soon. Keep up the momentum. You're doing great. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Billy. Bye, Bye Ryan. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye.